Good morning, Green Valley. Good to see you. Glad to be here. Um, for those of you that were here last week, um, good to see you again. And um, I, I get the chance to stand in for Doug for one more week. And um, it's a great honor and privilege to, to be able to do that. And uh, wanted to say thank you for the handful of you that shared encouraging words um, during the week. And then um, uh, Nikki in the church office passed along an email uh, from some folks that um, I think speaks real well of, of Green Valley Church and you all. Um, it says this, uh, we attended Green Valley for the first time last week, and we were looking for, for four things in a, in a church. We were looking for a, a, youth, a children's ministry where our kids can um, enjoy and be excited about coming to church, and after um, their Sunday, um, they enjoyed it and looked forward to coming back. Uh, we also wanted to find a church with um, worship that draw, drew us to God, and um, we were blessed with the, the great worship team. Uh, we were also looking for a church with a, a warm, welcoming congregation, and we really received that well and uh, enjoyed the coffee. Uh, we were also looking for some, some great teaching, and after this weekend we thought, well, three out of four is not bad. <laughs> so, real good. All right. So uh, last week we uh, took a look at Psalm 145 that um, gave us a great picture of God's character, his nature, what he's done, and just how good and how great he is and what a great reminder that was for us to continually remind ourselves of that. And uh, today we're going to take a look at another passage here that's going to um, teach us another great truth that our, our minds just need to be con constantly reminded of, of that is who we are in, in the view and the eyes of God. And so picture with me if you would, um, a bunch of uh, teenagers in a school gymnasium for uh, basketball tryouts. And none of them know each other. They've all been selected to come, and they're kind of sizing up the room of like, wow, he's a big one. Wow, that guy can really shoot the threes, and he can jump them. And they're kind of like, who's the best? Who's the worst? And where do I fit in the midst of this? But picture with me, if you will, Michael Jordan walking into the gym and saying, boys, 22. He's the best kid I've seen in years. Well, all of a sudden, everybody's view of number 22 has certainly been elevated because the GOAT, the greatest of all time, Mr. Michael Jordan, said, this is what I think of him. In the same way, and even in a greater way, when God says, this is what I think of you, I hope it holds a lot of weight in our hearts and our minds when he says this about you and me. So, with that being said, I'm going to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up in verse 1. And this is a letter um, written to a, a church, um, a small town called Ephesus, and we're going, to, we're going to pick it up. So, as you're there, here we go. It starts off, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So, in ancient times, when you would write a letter you would start off by saying, who's writing it? We would write a letter, and we would finally get to the end and write, you know, sincerely, Rob Schreiber, sincerely, the Apostle Paul. But here, it was custom, custom to start off, who's writing the letter? So it's Paul. And now, um, if you're not familiar with Paul, um, used to be a Pharisee, and an intense persecutor of Christians in the early church. And if you haven't read Acts chapter 9, or it's been a long time since you've read Paul's story, I invite you to take a look at Acts 9 and, and seeing the amazing transformation that God does in the life of Saul, turning him into Paul, and now the driving force of the early church. And Paul not only wrote this letter to the Ephesians, he wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books, so an amazing influence that God used in the life of the early church. So again, to who? To the saints who are in Ephesus and, uh, and are the faithful in Christ Jesus. So to the saints. Um, perhaps you might think that saints are only the people who have lived yesteryear and the heroes of the faith, and the only way to be deemed a saint is to be dead and to then be honored for your sainthood of what you've done. But Paul is saying, you Ephesians are saints. You are um, set apart. You are, um, let me pick it up because this is really important and I don't want to miss it. When he says, you are set apart in your believers. Like, I have a special plan for you and your believers. So 
just to know that God says you're saints. And that's something that we get to lean into. Now he's going to go into a blessing in verse 2. It says, Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. He's giving a blessing to them in the beginning here. Now we're going to step into verses 3 and 4. 3 through 14. Have you ever met a person that when they get excited about what they talk about, they begin to speak faster and faster and louder and louder, and they kind of get this momentum of going, and they just have this thought that they just can't stop talking about it, and when they keep going, they don't want to stop because they're not going to let you interrupt, and they don't want to get distracted, and they just have to communicate how good this news is they're going to share. <laughs> well, this is Paul. If verses 3 through 14 in the Greek, when he wrote it, is one big, giant, run-on sentence. It is the longest continuous sentence in Scripture, and some have coined it the most profound sentence ever penned to paper because of what it contains. So, what is Paul so excited to share about us that he couldn't even stop to put a period in the midst of this thought. We're going to pick it up in verse 13. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So, in the beginning, he says, blessed be the God. Another way of saying, thanks be to God for what I'm about to share. So he just prefaces it one more time. Then he goes on to say this, and we're going to see this and we're filling in the blanks. I am blessed with every spiritual blessing. So you see here in this verse where it says, who has blessed us. This has happened. This isn't something that we're waiting for. This has happened. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Um, The Israelites in the Old Testament, they were promised with a blessing, and and part of it was this blessing of the promised land, and it was this physical place, this tangible place. But now God is saying, you have a spiritual blessing. Here it comes. It's a spiritual blessing, and it's in a place, in the heavenly places, Five times Paul uses this language of heavenly places in the book of Ephesians. So we, if you kind of skip down to verse 20, you would see that Jesus is seated at the right hand in the heavenly places. So this is where Jesus is. This is where our spiritual blessings reside. And it's a safe place for these blessings to reside. But he's going to unpack all the things that are being blessed upon us. Again, in verse 3, it says, Who has blessed us in Christ? 180 times in the New Testament, this phrase, in Christ, is used, but Paul really likes this phrase to communicate what we have in Christ, so much so that he uses it um, about 140 to 150 times in the course of the 13 books that he wrote. But in this book of Ephesians, 36 times he uses in Christ, in him, to describe what we have in him. So just have this lens of all of these things are what we get when we are in Christ. And just to kind of frame it, this is what we have in Christ So before we are in Christ, we have none of these things. This is the blessing that we have when we choose to receive what Christ has done and when we are in Christ. Verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So if you're following along, we see this. I am chosen. He chose us from the foundation of the world, from the beginning. He's above and beyond time, and he said, I'm choosing you. 
and now he views us as holy and blameless. This idea of being chosen is pretty profound. I don't know if you have memories of being at the playground. Two captains, always the two best players, they're going to pick players, and they kind of go, oh, we'll take that person, we take him, we take him. And, you know, there were some of us who usually got picked in the front part. Some of us got chosen in the middle. And then some of us were just, oh, dear Lord Jesus, do I not be last? Today, just once, can I not be last? But then sometimes those of us who were last, you know, you're kind of going back and forth, back and forth. And by default, you're the last person. And the, but sometimes the captain would go, yeah, we don't want him. You can have him. And you're just like, oh, I just feel so edified being out at the playground. Um, you know, like default, like we kick you to the other team because we don't want to choose you. But it's pretty profound, this idea of being chosen because of what the people are saying, like I see worth in you and I want to choose you. So I, um, this, this kind of idea came to mind of the NFL draft and here are these Herculean athletes that you just think so rough and tough and physical specimens of, um, but here's the profoundness for them when they are told, when a team says, we want to choose you. Follow along, please. Packers select Rashawn Gary, linebacker, Michigan. They can go to ready to go to work. There's Rashawn Gary, and he is emotional. His dream is coming true. Let's go. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, coach. I appreciate it. 2017 NFL Draft, the Pittsburgh Steelers select Juju Smith-Schuster. Sometimes in the NFL draft, you watch a player that's been told that you're going to be selected high in the draft, and you just watch them slide and slide, and just like, and just like, oh my gosh, is anybody going to pick me? But I, I just the, the imagery of that is so profound for me of them just being saying, just the impact of wow, we want you, we choose you, we value you, and that is what God has said to us. I choose you. You're that valuable and important to me. So last week, if you were here, I got to share some stories of our family's trip of living in Uganda for three months. And if you were here, we got to meet a friend of mine named Happy Jimmy. Um, this week, I'd like to share another story of, of somebody that I met that's had a profound impact on me. So here, um, this is Ivan. And um, Ivan is in his late 20s. And the uh, backstory of Ivan, when he and his twin sister were six months old in a car ride with their family, their car was struck by another vehicle, and uh, both of his parents tragically died in that accident. And so both he and his sister Brenda were orphaned. His aunties said, Brenda, we choose you. And they brought Brenda in, and they said, Ivan, we don't choose you and just kind of put him off into the orphanage. And for the next 15 years, Ivan's going back and forth between orphanages and living on the streets, knowing that his sister was chosen and he wasn't. And just to kind of, I can't even imagine of what, what that's like. I've talked to him a lot of just what that's like to not be chosen. Fast forward, when he's 15, he gets chosen um, to go and to live in the Netherlands with a family. And um, just the, the profound impact of what it is to know that this family says, we choose you. Fast forward, he um, spends the rest of his teen years, early 20s, um, meets a young gal. They get engaged. They move to Uganda to start an orphanage because Ivan was an orphan. He has a heart for orphans. So they give their lives and they start an orphanage in eastern Uganda. And it's, it's thriving. 200 kids are um, being told they're chosen and we're going to take care of you. Tragically, Ivan's fiance too, dies in a car wreck. Ivan moves to a new part of Uganda, kind of his hometown, and finds 110 kids, and is now in the process of saying, 
I choose you, and it's kind of been a fun privilege and honor to walk alongside him in telling these kids that they're chosen, putting them back into school, feeding them, and giving them hope and a purpose and telling them the message, you were chosen. Ivan's the hands and the feet of Jesus. This picture right here in the corner in front of the thatched roof, Ivan was driving around and found these four kids living on their own, ages four, six, eight, and ten. Um, they've been living on their own for more than a year. It, it's just, but the profoundness of being, these kids being told, you're chosen. We're no different. Where God says, I choose you. I hope that just resonates that what God thinks of you and I. Let's pick it up in verse 5. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So if you're following along in the next slide, you're going to see this. I'm adopted. This is God's plan. So, so we could, uh, I could bring volumes and volumes of commentaries by many theologians to try and unpack this concept of the spectrum of, of what the church has landed on in this idea of uh, predestined. Um, and this is God's design. I would say this. This is God's design. His design and purpose is that he wants to adopt us into his family. He sits above time. He can look and say, this is what I want to do for each and every person. And a couple scriptures that um, I land on, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, where the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some are count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's God's plan and desire that everyone be adopted into his family. Um, I don't know if you knew this, uh, but our junior high youth pastor, Wes McCord, um, is adopted. And he tells the story of, of being adopted. And it, the, the process kind of started when he was young. And it lasted for all of the paperwork and legality all the way to the age of 16 until it could finally be. And they had obstacle after obstacle after obstacle of this adoption process. And he talks about just the absolute profound impact of knowing that his parents were saying, every obstacle and challenge is worth overcoming so that we can adopt you into our family. And just to know that he is a chosen and adopted has radically changed his life. And is when he shares the gospel with kids, he can't help but land in this passage in Ephesians to talk about this is what happened to me. But this isn't just a physical adoption, it's a spiritual adoption that we could all be a part of. Um, I'd like to show another video clip of just the, kind of the profoundness of being chosen and adopted. So here's kind of some other little videos of kids and um, being told that they're being adopted. I'm going to be adopted? <laughs> I can say that is because today, with all of our family and friends, is the day I get to adopt you. So not only is it impactful for, look, at this is God's message to us, that I love you and value you this much, that I want you into my family. Taking us from a, a situation where we're outside of Christ and saying, I want you in the family. 
It's a great reminder of what God has done for us and invites us into. Um, in a lot of things in, in the concept of adoption in, in this time in, Ro- in the Roman world, um, but part of it was that it was also common for adults to be adopted into a family. And if you adopted an adult into your family, if that person had any outstanding debts, the person who was the adopting saying, I'm wiping your slate clean. I'm paying all your debts. I'm giving you a new name. You're into my family. Doesn't that mirror the gospel of God saying, you had a debt of sin. And through the blood of Jesus, I'm going to pay this debt, wipe it clean, and invite you into the family of God. It's such a beautiful picture and reminder of who we are in the eyes of God. All right, we've got a lot to cover in the few minutes, so listen fast, will you? Verse 7, or verse 6, uh, To the praise of His glorious grace, which He has blessed us in the Beloved. So this glorious grace of, of just this idea that He's graced us and He's accepted us in, so if you're following along, I'm accepted. This grace of God says, I'm accepting you into my family. Verse 7, in him, there we go again, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So if you're following along, two things that we find here in verse 7 that says, I am redeemed and I am forgiven. And this idea of of redemption is... um, This idea here that these terms really kind of have this weight and meaning rooted into the state of being um, in the state of slavery, where a person is bought out of slavery once and for all, that this person can't be sold again, and you're being purchased out of this condition. Um, And so this is... This, when this redemption and forgiveness are so, so intertwined is because this, this payment that's been happening, this redemption, is through what Jesus did on the cross, and it's the power of forgiveness. Um, in talking to a friend of mine who's um, a middle school principal, and he was at a conference this week, and he said, you know, the teens of just trying to figure out what's going on in life, and especially post-COVID, and they asked, like, they did this survey across the country, and uh, kids filled out, what do they need to know the most, and what do they need to figure out? We were both really shocked with it, that kids today need to know that they're forgiven. They feel, they're being, they feel like they're behind, they feel like they're dumb, they feel like they don't measure up, they feel like their mistakes have so defined them. And, I mean, this was a secular study, that they're just carrying such weight of guilt and shame they, and they, they need to figure out what it means to be forgiven. It's such a powerful thing. So for us to know that the, our former life and the sins of our life has been forgiven and we're clean and we're being adopted with a new name and a new life. We're going to pick it up a little more in verse 8. And he says, which he has lavished upon this. Such beautiful description of what he has done. It's just, it's not held back is just lavishly upon us in wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purposes, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fulfillment of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will." So if you're following along, the next thing we see is that I am an heir. We have been given an inheritance. And this, when you get adopted into the family, you have all the same rights as the other family members. We don't kind of enter in as second-class citizens, second-class family members, stepchildren. Like We are in the family. In Romans 8.17, it says this, And if... We are his children, then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his spiritual blessings and inheritance. This idea that we're co-heirs, like we, we get invited into the family and there's nothing held back with all of these spiritual blessings. This, these last few verses are so rich and so impactful, but to, for the sake of this, just to know that we are we're an heir, and all of it comes with that. 
Pick it up in verse 12. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glories. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So if we're following along, we see this. I am sealed by the Holy Spirit. Perhaps you're familiar with, with this kind of imagery. Um, so common practice was that everybody had their unique signet in their, their sign. And when they would stamp something, they would say, this is from this person or this belongs to this person. And, and this is the Holy Spirit is God's seal saying, you're mine. And these promises are yours. These belong to you through the Holy Spirit. And this idea of the Holy Spirit being our guarantee, it's, it's more than a pledge um, for it's a down payment or an installment or it's earnest money. It's like a, a, an engagement ring, like you are mine. The Holy Spirit's yours and he's the guarantee of our inheritance. And these are all the things that we get and there's, there's so much more in, in Ephesians. It just goes on and on and on. But to stop here in this one big, giant, amazing sentence where Paul, through the Holy Spirit, wants us to know how much we have in Christ and what God thinks of us. So, if you're following along, here's what I would love. Knowing, believing, and living out of who God says we are empowers us to live the life God has called us to. In my, in my work with teenagers, they desperately are searching for their identity and how do I get it and they're being bombarded with an unending amount of messages. Us too. We all are trying to figure out who am I? Where do I get my worth? Where do I get my value? And this is what God says he thinks of us. And I hope it carries great weight in, the, in our hearts and our minds. And all of this is found in Christ. There's a process from us being outside of Christ to going in, and I kept playing with this idea, all this in, out, in, out, and I go, huh, I wonder if there's anything around town that would maybe remind me of this. <laughs> so, my hope would be, as you're driving around town, when you see this sign, may this be a reminder of all of the blessings that we have in Christ. So, we can get a good burger, and we can be reminded of the greatness that we possess. And I would say not, not, um, not all of us. I'm not going to assume that all of us are in Christ. Some of us are still in our journey of discovering what it means to have a life of faith and what it means to have a life of giving our life to Christ. And this is the invitation that, that we're given And this is a great reminder. So if you're ever feeling discouraged, down, out, of trying to figure out who you are, you need a good reminder, read this passage. Read this amazing sentence. If you know of others that need to be reminded of who they are and what God says of them, read this over and over and over again. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for what you, the God of the universe, says about us and what you are willing to do to bring us into the family of God and what you chose to do on the cross to pay off the debt that we had through the sins of our life. And you say, you are worth it. I choose you. I want you into the family. And if you're in the midst of this journey and today's the day where you think and come to the place in your heart and your mind where you say, yes, I want to be in Christ. I want to be in the family of God. I want to leave my old life and become brand new. You pray along with me to saying, God, I know what I've done in the past is wrong. Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross in my behalf to pay and wipe out my debt of sin. And 
I receive the free gift of life and the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you for making me a new creation in Christ. And I believe who you say I am. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, I will walk in it.